Good morning, good morning, good morning. Derek Watson, the angry dentist here. It's Wednesday, April 20th. Quite a cold day actually. Last night was a bit of a sort of a frost, sort of a quasi frost. Just been in the local shop getting the papers. They uh, say that they're uh, talking about the apples saying the farmers are ruined. Oh, it's big apple growing country around here. So, any, any scuttlebutt that the apples are even thinking of being ruined is big news in the local newspaper shop. Anyway, what happened to you yesterday, Angry, you're saying? Yesterday I went to visit my daughter. It's unusual for me to have a day off in the week, but it does happen. So, uh, yeah, so anyway, here I am again. So, what's today? Wednesday? Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Okay, three days to go. Got quite a few, and, and nice days as well, you know, like long appointments, bridge fits and stuff like that, so. Been mostly chatting, mostly chatting. I'm sort of uh, looking at <clears throat> contemporaneous dental news, which is, which is sort of quite a laugh in itself, isn't it? Because the way that, the speed that things move in the dental world is like glacial, isn't it? It's like swimming in golden syrup. So like something might be, you know, news in January and then everyone will hear about it in February and then, you know, <laughs> most people will know about it by the middle of July and uh, decide what they think about it by September. So there's not the sort of the, <laughs> there's not the requirement to react on a like a Sky News type basis. So, oh, I tell you what has happened, the, um, Theresa May has called a snap general election. If you want a real laugh, download a, uh, an article in the Telegraph on the 10th of April, about 10 days ago, about, uh, about number 10 uh, denying, you know, refusing a call for a snap general election. <laughs> and all the quotes, I say, no, it wouldn't be a good idea because you know, it would desettle de the country and blah, blah, blah. And then 10 days later, oh, apparently it's a brilliant idea. And this is, like, this is a fantastic example of. Uh, uh, what you know, some people call it a U-turn. I would just call it like a tremendously self-serving approach to the truth. You know, to say say whatever's expedient to you at the time, not necessarily uh, what uh, you know a cold hard analysis of the facts might uh, arrive at. So, and of course that's how you know everyone's going on about fake news at the moment because that all started because somebody probably within the Democrats leaked old Hillary in Clinton's internal emails and then they tried to deny it and say that it was, you know, they're not saying that it's not their emails, but they're not saying that it was their emails either. And, you know, and uh, they were annoyed that uh, the truth came out. And so uh, the truth and fake news sort of got conflated. And, uh, YouTube now a lot of people closing down their YouTube channel. Fortunately, I don't rely on uh, income from sponsors or advertising for my YouTube channel. I'm not saying that it won't get shut down. It might do. I don't know. You know if I upset enough people, then it probably will. my uh, my YouTube channel. I should imagine was is probably classified by the BDA and the GDC as fake news. It's a fake news channel. And they probably want Coca-Cola to withdraw their sponsorship. Well, I I got. Uh, but Coca-Cola's not going to withdraw their sponsorship from my channel, I'll tell you that. <laughs> oh no, no, nor McDonald's, nor Nike. So uh, I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> as long as I've got 12 people looking at this, which is, you know, my standard for a large crowd, then uh, uh, I'm going to carry on. Actually, I mean, I was, again, I was sort of willing to, sort of wanted to talk to you about this because you may wonder why I've suddenly started churning out videos, like you know, like like the end of the world is nigh, and I want to put my stuff down <laughs> to record. Well, it might be nigh. I don't know. I'm about to come up to Death Junction, so you never know uh, when when the end of the world is nigh, do you? But um, anyway, um, the answer is that <clears throat> when you're sort of trying to communicate with people, which is what uh, most of what I've done in my entire sort of career in sort of 
pseudo dental pseudo politics, analysing treatment provision systems and things like that. It's all about, uh, you know, first of all, researching and building up an internally consistent model of dentistry and how dentistry works and how it would work best. And uh, given the sort of the internal and external forces acting upon it, and then, um, and then. The second step is to communicate that to people, isn't it? To sort of try and to persuade people, to influence and bring people around to your point of view. And so, and a lot of that is all about communicating. So whether it's uh, through um, setting up meetings with um, central government or giving evidence to House of Commons Select Committee or producing a magazine or uh, sending out uh, emails and things like that, this is all part of uh, communications. Now, um, a lot of you know my history will know that uh, I sort of took a sabbatical from general practice to run the Dental Practitioners Association and the Dental Fusion Organisation as it, as it then became known. Um, and so I didn't do, I wasn't working in clinical practice for a number of years and then uh, sort of decided that the association wasn't really taking up all of my time and my time would be better spent. Uh, earning money, you know, paying my mortgage. Ha! <laughs> There's a luxury. Um, which is why I, uh, you know, bought this second-hand dental practice, and I'm, which is where I'm now working. Now, you are probably running a dental practice, so you know the amount of work that's involved in that, you know. And I certainly, in the very early days of the GDPA, so when I first joined in sort of the late 70s, um, I sort of very, I fairly rapidly rose up the ranks to become chairman. And that was because being chairman was a lot of work. You know, it was a lot of work and not many people wanted to do it. There was a sort of a certain amount of prestige. People used to stand for the kudos of, of being the chairman, but uh, uh, they, they sort of uh, wanted the title without the work, if you see what I mean. Whereas I was sort of more interested in, in what could be achieved through the association, through the offices of the association, and being the chief officer was almost like incidental. I mean, I'm not saying I didn't enjoy it, but I mean, it was it was a bit of a pain in the ass, to be honest. There we go, death junction. Watch out! Watch out! So, so what you're looking for when you're communicating is something that's yeah. Sorry. So, um, so what would happen was I would. I would turn up at a meeting, and although I, I had a secretary, really I used to bring with me everything that I'd used in my my job as chair, and that was like about eight or ten lever arch files, which I used to carry in in a messy great cardboard box, and um, uh, at the time I was a sort of single-handed dental practitioner, and it just occurred to me that I just couldn't do both. You know, I couldn't. It was affecting. It was really badly affecting the practice. My you know, I was my, my staff were constantly saying to the patients, "Oh, Derek can't do that afternoon because he's driving up to London because he's got a meeting at the Liberal Club of the Southern Branch." Or, "Don't know, Derek can't do that Saturday because it's you know he's going up to Ariel Hotel in Heathrow to for a meeting of the council, etc., etc." And um, you know, it really affected my standard of living, my uh, income, and everything. So it was like quite a relief to me when. Uh, that stopped, you know, and I was able to concentrate and go back to sort of concentrating on practice. And so I've had this a bit of a sort of a deja vu uh, moment where, having bought a practice, you know, um, sort of realised that uh, the practice, the demands of the practice are such that you can't do everything that you want. That's what it boils down to. It's nothing more than that. It just means that you can't do everything that you want uh, on top of running a dental practice. And so what I've been doing is I've been looking for a way of communicating easily to people and uh, in a way that doesn't require much sort of post-production. And I know it sounds stupid, but um, you know, when, when I was communicating with to people through the leader of the Dental Practice magazine, um, that was about a thousand words, 1100 words, but it took me a day to write that. Now it didn't take me a day to write a thousand words. I mean, I could write a thousand words in an hour, but they were the wrong thousand words. They always are to start off with, you know, you always start off and 
when you get if you get a writer's block, the, the only way round to do it is to just write anything. Just write anything. I mean, you can write a story about a little rabbit just to get you started, and then you think, I, I won't make it about a rabbit. I'll make it about the rabbit's teeth. And then you think, oh, I won't make it about the rabbit's teeth. I'll make it about NHS dentistry. And then, like four hours later, you get you get quite a good leader out of it, out of this rabbit story. But um, the the problem again, the problem with that was that you know they used to pay me. I think uh, I forget what it was. It was a hundred pounds or something. A hundred pounds for a thousand words. So it was like ten words for a pound. So <laughs> I'm just thinking, huh? I'd write ten words for a pound. You know, ten words for a pound. <laughs> but no, that's not actually. You know, for, for people who can write words, the right sort of words, that is not nowhere near the amount of work that goes into producing those ten words. I mean, I can write ten words for a pound if you don't mind me using like a random word generator. <laughs> but the trouble is, if you're if you're like a commentator or you know some a pundit, <laughs> you're you can't just write any old words, you know, they have to, and also they have to, they have to be internally consistent and they have to, people have to go back over your, um, over your articles, like written a few years and go say, yeah, 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 I can see what he was saying there, or yeah, he was right about that, or they might just, like, remember something you say and say, and think, well, in a couple of years time he said, this is going to happen, and I'm going to judge him by whether or not it happens, and, you know, you're, you're in a deep doo-doo if it doesn't happen. Um, you know, so you have to be, uh, you can't just do what most people do, which is that they, they sort of say, just was famous for this, mom. He was, I used to love He was a, he's a fantastic bloke, but whatever he does, do the opposite of it. That's my advice. If he says, if he says, don't register for that, then register for that. Because you, you can't go wrong doing the opposite of what says. <laughs> But um, anyway, communication. If you, so I'm looking for, I'm looking for an outlet and the best type of outlet is really um, uh, something that sort of fits in with your daily routine as this does. Something that occupies time that would, is otherwise unused, which this does. And as I say, something that doesn't require a lot of post-production, which this doesn't, because it's done as a monologue. You know, I mean, there probably there may be a few cuts in here because I've said something rude about someone that I'm going to have to cut out. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cut it out. I'm sorry. I'm not even. No, 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 no. It's no use trying to say if you, you know, is there a premium version of the channel uncensored? That perhaps we might bring that in, but you know, at the moment I'm just going to have to cut it out. Sorry, sorry. So, yeah, I am. Yeah. Okay, so where was I? Yeah, so nurse indemnity, right? So I'm nearly at work now. And that, why do you keep me talking like this? You keep me talking, and then by the time I get round to the actual thing I meant to talk about, I'm nearly at work. So, do dental nurses require indemnity insurance? That is the question. That is the thing. That is the question that Mike Clark used to say. Mike Clark used to. Oh. <laughs> he used to write. He used to write these articles, and then he used to say, "What? What? 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 Is this going to happen? Is that going to happen? Who knows?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Well, not you, you pelic." I've just read your entire article saying, you know, entitled The Future of Dentistry, and you say, in the future, this may happen. In the future, this may happen. And I'm thinking, yes, it may happen, or it may not happen. So give me a clue. What's your opinion? Do you think it's going to happen, or do you think it's not going to happen? And then what he would do, he'd get right to the end of the article, and then he would put, only time will tell. So that's right, because you're certainly not going to tell, you pillock. <laughs> nurse indemnity, okay. The question of whether nurses require indemnity is the actual question. 
and I'll and I'll and that's a bit cryptic. But let me just bear with me for two seconds. Right? The National Health Service. It matters. It matters a lot to the National Health Service in general. And I'm not just talking about dental nurses. I'm talking about general nurses, obstetric nurses, nursy nurses. Right? Nurse, nurse, nurses. Starched, all white. You know, all crisp, clean, pressed nurses. So, do they require indemnity? Well, this was a. And a question that was like crucial for the National Health Service and it was crucial for the following reason that if that, that um, if a doctor cocks up and the National Health Service is covered by their indemnity scheme you know they're like you know we have like a general whoever cocks up it, we, we pay up the scheme <coughs> so the question was should the nurses be included in that scheme because it's a nurse who's assisting or instrumental in the carrying out of the patient's care if they're negligent are they negligible are they negligent as a clinician in their own right uh, or are they merely employees and and therefore and an employee can't be negligent I mean I'd, technically they can be negligent. they would they could do something you know they could knowingly do something knowing knowing that what they were doing was tantamount to negligence in which case you know then they'd have a hard hard uh, uh, job falling back on the uh, the fallback position for any employee which is to say that if I was negligent then I was negligent because I wasn't trained properly or I wasn't supervised properly right so that is the default position and it's called vicarious liability which means that it doesn't mean the vicar's liable. <clears throat> it means that for most employees are not deemed to be sensible enough or responsible enough to even be negligent because they're not supposed to be making their own decisions. That's the whole, the essence of the employer-employee relationship is I'm the employer, you're the employee, you do what I effing well tell you and, <clears throat> and therefore if you're not doing something right then I, I have to take the blame because, I, you know, that's... The relationship is that you're doing only what I tell you yeah it's my fault if I haven't you know okay so the lot of so blame goes upwards like private Ryan so anyway they decided they needed to uh, settle this question once and for all because so what they did was they hired a doctor called Finley Scott Dr Finley ah Dr Finley and Finley Scott carried out a review which was called sexually titled something like review of requirement for nurses to have indemnity in the National Health Service and he came down quite clearly quite and unequivocally on the side that you would expect him to and the side that the NHS wanted him to which was that nurses do not need to source their own indemnity cover because they are covered by the vicarious liability which arises as a result of the fact that they are employed okay so they're employees so basically if you want to sue anyone for negligence you don't sue the nurse if you do want if you do think the nurse was negligent then what you do is you find out who employed the nurse and you sue them okay they're the people who need insurance against negligence so that's called the Scott review and in fact I'll probably put a link to it in the notes but I don't know whether you'll find it uh, um, it's a bit difficult to find on the NHS. It sort of disappeared, uh, not on the on the internet. It sort of disappeared, but it can be found. Anyway, we brought this to the attention of members years ago. So, so there you've got the Scott Review saying that nurses, including dental nurses, any employees basically, really are covered by vicarious liability. Quite clearly, in black and white. So then, what happens is, along comes the Dental Nurses Association. And they're approached by a Lloyds underwriter, medical insurer, called W.R. Berkeley, uh, who I know very well because they were the underwriters for the Dental Practitioners Association when, for a short while, we had a, an, a scheme underwritten by them at uh, Lloyds. Sharon Brennan, lovely woman, she said, Don't, we're not Berkeley, we're Berkeley. She said, remember, we're Berks, a bunch of Berks, she said. No comment. Anyway, uh, they decided that uh, they would quite like to put together a nurse indemnity scheme because at that time nurses were coming on the register and there are thousands of them. I mean, the number of nurses dwarfs the number of dentists, which means that you could probably charge them a lot less and still get tons of money, right? 
There's only two problems with that. One is nurses never ever have a claim. Nobody ever sues a nurse. But what does a nurse do, really, that causes that causes a massive negligence claim? And secondly, they're all skin. They've got no money. So you can't, you know, it's not they're not like dentists where you could say, oh, it's the law, statutory duty, you've got to pay thousand pounds a year or something. No. Did I say a thousand? I meant two. Actually, no, no, sorry, I meant four. Or I uh, no six, because you'll play no one no, in eight implants. So they put together this ridiculous membership for the Dental Nurses Association, which includes indemnity insurance in the sure and certain knowledge that it's going to be a money-making scheme because no nurse is ever going to claim. And it worked to the extent that so few nurses made a claim, they had to start thinking of how they might pay some money out. They were like, it was embarrassing. All the money was coming in and no money was going out because no bugger was suing a nurse. And they were having trouble justifying the scheme because they were like, people were saying, oh really, what's the, what's the risk? You know, what's the risk? Why am I paying this premium? What am I insuring against? And they couldn't say nothing, could they? Oh, I'm going to have to finish this tomorrow, you know. So anyway, right, okay, well, we're going to have to leave it there, okay, right, sorry. Well, it was you that kept chatting. So, so just remember where we are in the story, all right? British Dental Nurses Association put together a membership that included indemnity, but nobody claimed on it. All it was doing was bringing in money. Right. <sighs> I'm going to go indoors. At least it's warm in there. I'll, um, I'll talk to you tomorrow. All right, have a nice day. Bye.